in in Japan. You know, it it, it just takes a, it's a you need to look at the future with a different paradigm than the past. And I think all the political leaders in the West think we need these huge power plants. But the, the paradigm's different now. The, the, um, with distributed power and with smart grids, we, can, we don't need huge power plants that are far away from cities. We can have distributed generation that's in the city or near the city that actually reduces the amount of, um, of, of total power consumption because you don't have all the power line losses and things like that. But our leaders are so locked in to these um, one, the huge companies that make these power plants um, and pay their campaign contributions that they um, um, are stuck in the model of building huge power plants uh, that cost $20 billion. Yeah, one of the guests on this Nuclear Free Future conversation was an Indian activist, uh, Ms. Patel, who was telling us about the largest uh, computer nuclear reactor in the world, which was being built in this rural area and uh, decimating the mango plantations, and also mm -hmm. people who are being killed and their, their land is being taken over by eminent domain there by the government because the government is sponsoring the nuclear power reactors in India. So this is another example of things going on, same as and, and worse. And also, uh, I believe somebody questioned you uh, after our last program about Bill Gates being involved in, um, in, yes. uh, in, in the nuclear power industry now. And, uh, we, we did check that, Arnie, and you and I about it, and uh, he's, he's pushing the depleted uranium nuclear power, power reactors and also doing the research and development with, with China. Well, he's also so. doing these small reactors, these small modular reactors, and he's supporting that concept. So, uh, you know, you too can have one in your backyard, Margaret, you know, mm. little communities and towns that would want to have them could have them. One of the things, you know, when we look at, at stuff in the U.S., um, Daily Coast had an article today um, about a plant in South Carolina that uh, sits below a dam, and the d or it's an earthen dam that is, is failing. And the NRC, which rarely gets concerned about anything, is very concerned about this dam, and below it, sits um, four nuclear plants and you know here are these reactors below it and if the dam fails it would cause a, a 32 foot tsunami a wave that would come down and flood over this four foot wall that protects these plants downriver so you know over and over again we hear the industry say oh we can't have a tsunami in in this country but we can, and you know this accident ha in at Fukushima and, the, and it is still accidents waiting to happen in this country because the regulator hasn't done its job and the industry is not proactive. And I don't think it ever will be. Yeah, you know, we've come up with um, a couple reports on our website. One is um, about the the bolts on top of the nuclear reactor getting. Um, Overpressurized and the, actually the containment and and and, and lifting, um, that's something the industry has known about for 40 years. Another report we had on the website is the at the bottom of the nuclear reactor, on a boiling water reactor, there's about 70 holes, and the likelihood of a melt through on a boiling water reactor, like for Mount Yankee, like Fukushima, is enormously more than any other reactor out there of the pressurized design. So we've known that since the 80s. And we just came up with another report on our website um, that talks about the electrical wires that go through the containment. The containment's not this monolithic thing. You've got to get electricity in, and you've got to get electrical signals out. And f since 1982, they've said that it's likely on the Mark I containment that those electrical penetrations will fail and the containment will fail. All this stuff is not news from Fukushima. It's been 1970s and 1980s. Well, we've known it for 30 years. Are you optimistic about the Japanese people and how they're handling this disaster? No, no. I, I mean, there's people, the, the, the publisher, Shueisha, who came 
to us for this book. They wanted to do this book and they approached us. They are part of a group that is really concerned about the future of Japan. But there are equally many, many people as Arnie and our daughter who, who went with him found out over there. There are many, many people who just say, please don't talk about it. We don't want to know. The government tells us it's okay. And uh, next month they're allowing people to move back into within 23 kilometers of the plant and two cities are reopening even though those areas still have high radiation exposures. You know, they still trust their government. So that's one piece, that's a part of the Japanese culture. And the other piece of it is that they, um, they buy into the old paradigm, we need these big nuclear plants. Now, the, to, to the Germans' credit, they said, no, we're gonna, we're gonna remove these. Over the next 10 years, we're getting rid of these big nuclear plants. So they broke the paradigm. And of course, once you do that, you're sort of, you become an atheist, essentially. And um, um, the Japanese can do that too. They can say, you know, over the next 10 years, or right now, or whatever, we're not gonna use nukes. But they're, um, they're being told by Tokyo Electric and their government that, oh my God, the world is gonna end if we don't have them. Um, in fact, it's gonna be tough. It's gonna be tough one way or the other, and it's tough now, thank you, Fukushima. So that um, the, the net effect is that they, uh, they have a choice to move forward with a new paradigm and potentially make a lot of money selling it to the rest of the world or they can buy into the old paradigm and go back into making nuclear power plants. That was why we chose the title of the book. It's the truth and the future. They've got an alternative in the future um, to buy into a new energy paradigm and become a, a dynamic industrial powerhouse if they want. Now they can be the cutting edge in the world economy. And with that, We'll, we'll close this, this portion of our, our discussions, and I hope that you will come back again at some Definitely. point when you, when you do have time to do it. And uh, we're, you were going to show a, a Fairwinds video about the containment that failed before the venting. So could you tell us a little bit about that? And, uh, but, uh, and, and just tell us about it. Sure. Um, the Union of Concerned Scientists um, um, was aware um, way back when the accident happened that the containment pressure went up and then went down and nobody could figure out why it went down because the containment vent had not been opened. Well, I did some research on that as well and um, determined that the bolts that hold these two pieces together on the containment were actually stretching because the pressure was so high the top was separating from the bottom. Now, this is 40-year-old data. The industry's known about it. And uh, yet um, everyone seems surprised that uh, suddenly um, it's, it's out there in public. So what we were able to do is take um, Union Concerned Scientist data, uh, data after the accident, some photographic evidence after the accident, then put it together in a nine minute video to explain just this one type of containment flaw that um, it's just one piece of the Mark I puzzle. Okay. Thank you very much, Arnie Gunderson. Thank you very much, Maggie Gunderson. Mm -hmm. And uh, please come back and uh, we'll get through March with the, and could, could you tell us something about March 11th, where you will be? Um, well, Arnie's doing a couple um, audio presentations, one in Vancouver, um, well, TV, it's a TV presentation, one in Vancouver, and then we're also doing a live presentation in Brattleboro that day. And, and uh, so that's at, I think, 5 p.m. And we're also um, working with um, a woman uh, who lives here in Vermont, but who uh, was born and raised in Japan and still travels frequently back to Japan. She's there now. And she'll be talking about how people in Japan really feel, and we'll be talking about the technical aspects of the accident. Thank you very much, You're Maggie. Very welcome. Thank, thank you, you, Arnie. And thank you, viewers. And until next time, as we go toward a nuclear free future. Thank you for having us, Mark. Thank you. Hi, I'm Arnie Gunderson from Fairwinds. I've been thinking a lot lately about what happened in the first day of the nuclear accident at Fukushima. 
And I think I've come up with some interesting information that I wanted to share with you. The, the facility at, at, at Fukushima was one of the largest nuclear reactors in the world. And I'm sure you've seen the, the videos of it when, uh, when it was functioning, and it's truly an impressive um, facility. Well, everyone has also seen the, uh, the, the pictures of the facility after the explosions. And in that period of a couple days, it went from a several billion dollar asset to a hundreds of billion dollar liability. And I believe it's the uh, single biggest industrial accident in the history of the world. But I wanted to focus on what happened after the tsunami, but before the explosions. And I think there's some important information that can be gleaned from the historical record. I need to go back and, and talk a little bit about um, uh, nuclear fundamentals for a minute here, though. The nuclear reactor sits inside a nuclear containment. Now, the containment is, um, uh, we've shown before, and, and the one that's uh, on the screen now is the um, Browns Ferry nuclear reactor. The top of that containment has a lid on it, and it's connected by many, many bolts. So now I'm going to use a, a tea infuser here to explain it another way. This is the containment. The nuclear reactor sits inside the containment. And then that lid gets screwed to the top so that if there is an accident and a, and a pipe breaks inside the nuclear containment, in theory, all of the contaminated gases stay inside that containment. Well, it's been known for a long time that the Mark I reactor is a very small reactor containment. And uh, as a result, back in the 80s, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission added a vent to it. And the reason for that is that engineers didn't understand when they built this unit that hydrogen gases could build up after an accident. Well, that's exactly what happened at Fukushima. At Fukushima, the, the uh, nuclear reactor was uncooled, and the nuclear fuel became very hot and reacted with the water to create hydrogen gas. Now, the data for the first day of the accident is, uh, is troubling, to say the least. The, the data, as, as I've been able to put it together, is um, uh, pretty complicated, but we'll work our way through it here. The, the, this is a multi-column table. The first column is the time and the day. But what I'm interested in is the fourth column over. And that table is in um, uh, pascals, which is a measure of pressure. I'm going to convert those uh, to, to pounds per square inch, which most of us are much more comfortable talking about. At the bottom of the table is right before the accident, and the pressure was atmospheric. And what that means, 0.1, is normal pressure, 14.5 pounds per square inch. Then the tsunami came, the plant lost its power, and the next data point is about eight hours later. Because remember now, most of the, um, most of the components were, uh, didn't have electricity, so most of these readings were unavailable. Well, at two in the morning, the pressure inside the containment was almost nine times higher. That means it was about 125 pounds per square inch. This containment wasn't designed for 125 pounds per square inch. If you look a little further, though, by 9.30 in the morning, the pressure starts to drop. And for the next seven hours, the pressure's much lower than it was at 2 in the morning. So the question is, how could it be that the pressure in the afternoon was lower than the pressure in the early morning? 